And if it gets too cold, too warm, um, just complain. <laughs> and we'll, okay. Before we begin to share, um, I want to dedicate to the share to one of our colleagues who unfortunately passed away a little over a month ago, Tavi Gail Rock. I'm sure most of you remember. Um, she was a colleague, she was passionate in teaching. Um, but there's something about the way she taught, which is very important, that relates to the very concept of, of prophecy. What I wanted to say was, her classes were not only informative, but they were transformative. But I talked to Yehuda, by chance I bumped into Yehuda, her husband, uh, a little while ago. Um, and I was talking with him, and he said, he said it a different way. He said, usually in, in education, children we educate, and adults we teach. Understand? Make sense? Yeah, when we send a kid to school, we want him, we, we outsource parenting to the school system, don't we? Doesn't work, but it's a nice try. Um, but what we do is, usually we educate our children, and we teach adults. What he said is what Avigal did, is she educates adults. And that was right on the mark. Because her teaching, her goal was not just to give information, but to have an effect on people, to make their Judaism better and stronger, and she really cared that that would be the effect of her teaching. That concept of Zikaron, when we remember, the idea of Zikaron in Judaism in general, when we remember something, um, there's two types of memory. There's memory which is nostalgic, and there's memory which is transformative as well. For example, we remember a loved one, we miss them, we think about them, but the question is how much does that memory affect the way we live our lives day to day? So it could be a once a year memory and then you forget about it, or it can be a memory which is transformative that affects our life decisions and how we live our life, how we lead our life and how we act day to day. But just like there's memory in the realm of individuals, there's also memory at a national level. And this will take us to the book of Yermiel and to the nine days that we're in the midst of. An example of Zikaron, which is more positive, is the example, for example, um, Yitzhak Mitzrayim, we remember the Exodus. But when we have the commandment every day to remember the Exodus, it's not only gratitude to remember what happened, it's a memory that reminds us of why it happened. There's a reason why God put us into Egypt to take us out. And that memory is not just to thank God for what happened, but also that memory all through Chumash is going to change our behavior. Remember how you were mistreated, make sure not to do that to others. That's an example of a transformative memory as opposed to a, not just saying thank you, but acting thank you. Um, we can take that same idea to national memory when it comes to the nine days, remembering the destruction of the temple. We're not only remembering what happened 2,000 years ago and 3,000 years ago. We're not remembering the temple was destroyed, what we had. That's a nostalgic memory. The purpose of the fast days, the way the rabbis and for sure the prophets understood them, is to remember why the events happened. Not just, again, oh, I wish we had a temple, but to understand why it was lost and what needs to happen for it to return. In light of that, I want to give my introduction to the book of Yermiel, because that very concept may be the reason why we have the book of Yermiel. Now, when you hear a title of a book or a class called A Crash Course in Anything, there's three different reasons you might want to attend. One is because you read the book already and sort of want to discuss and have a better insight. One is because you haven't read the book yet and you want to have a better chance of understanding the book when you read it. Or the third possibility, which is the usual one, if I have a good crash course, I don't need to read the book. <laughs> so you're laughing because that's why you came. <laughs> the, um, my assumption is um, that you've heard of the book. You know a couple of nice songs from Mirmiel, Odio Shama Barei Yehuda, you sing at a wedding. You remember from Rosh Hashanah Davening, Haben Yakir Li, Racham Avakal Bana. A couple of Tarot the last two weeks. Um, you might have read it maybe in 929 or like, like, Zimra. No, you have to cover it and say you finished the book. But most of us really never studied the book for a very good reason. It's a difficult book to study and understand. What I want to help you with today is give you the background to the book to appreciate what the book is about so that I think in 929 is about a couple months from now. If you're doing 929, if not, you should. Uh, there's somewhere in the middle of Shmuel now. So after Shmuel is Yirmiyahu, Yishayahu. If you don't break down in Yishayahu, um, by the time you get to Yirmiyahu, hopefully, you'll remember something and it'll make the book a little bit easier to follow. Um, in general, before you read any book, not just Navi, any book you read, anything you read, you always have to ask yourself, why was this book written? 
I'll bring you a real easy example from the newspaper. When I'm reading a newspaper, am I reading news or I'm reading an opinion? How come you're all laughing? Because <laughs> you live in Israel, anywhere. In theory, a newspaper should have news. <laughs> Now, in the old days, there was a news section and an editorial page. Now it's all together, pretty much. But the, the idea of author's intent is important. When I'm reading a news piece, was the author of this news piece trying to give me information so I'm more educated and informed, and then I can make my own decisions? Or is the intention of that news writer to shape my opinion? I think it's called yellow journalism, if I remember the word from way back. The same thing when I'm reading a book of Nevoah, I have to ask myself, why was the book written? Why did the Navi write this book? But when we get to Nevoah, there's more questions. There's the original question, why did the Navi write whatever the Nevoah might be? There's another question, why and how the book was redacted, maybe by Chazaw or Anshay Knesset Agdola later on, by the elders of the assembly. But there's a bigger question, which is most important for the books of Tanakh, which the rabbi is saying, why was it canonized? Meaning, why was it included in the 24 books? The rabbis tell us there were many, hundreds, thousands maybe of prophets. Not all the books were canonized. What's the principle they follow? Nebuah Shnitzachad Adorot, a nebuah which is necessary for future generations, that's canonized. Got the idea? Which is often misunderstood because people think a prophecy that's predicting an event that's going to happen in the future. Let's say you're in the market and you want to know when to invest. So if I know when Mashiach's coming, I don't know whether you know to, to go in or go out, depends how you understand Mashiach. That was uh, Rav Alex this year before, I think. <laughs> um, is that something good happening or bad? Uh, but We often think as prophecies, books about the future, they're going to predict the future. In my opinion, that's a terrible misunderstanding. Every prophecy, every book of prophecy that's written, first and foremost is written for that specific generation. Yirmiya was writing for his audience, for his time period. The rabbis canonize a book when the message of that book has implications for future generations. In other words, I can study the book, and when I study the book and understand what it's about, I can apply that to a future generation. If the book has a lesson that's eternal, I'll canonize the book. If it's just for that generation, it doesn't need to be canonized. But the books that Chazal canonized are books that have messages for all generations. You can learn principles from them. And I think the book of Yirmiyahu is going to be very important because it'll give us information to understand not only what happened, if I go back to what we said before, the book of Yirmiyahu is not only informative, but transformative. The book of Yirmiyahu and all books of Nevim are not just to tell you what happened, but that knowledge of what happened should affect how you behave to the point that I'll say that the underlying purpose of the book is not to tell you what happened. It's to understand our relationship with God because in that sense, a Navi is a spokesperson on behalf of God. That's what the word Navi means. A Navi is someone speaking on behalf of someone. And a Navi is speaking on behalf of God to his people, giving them guidance. And we'd like to say the job of the Navi is not to predict history, but to shape history. So if we look at the book of Yirmiyahu, I'll tell you what it's not. It's not about the life of Yirmiyahu. It doesn't begin with what day he was born, how old he was when he finished Shas, how great his great-grandparents were, and things like that. We don't hear about that. And of course we don't hear about who he dated because we put those books in the harem. <laughs> it mentions when he was, his time period for sure, But it doesn't talk about his life. His life, if you read it, you can learn about his life from the book, but it wasn't written to teach you about his life. His, wife was, his life was very uh, tra tragic, as we'll see, as he himself says. Um, so it's not about his life. It could be a collection of his works. It could be this is a collection of the works of Yimriel. In fact, almost all the books of Nevim Achronim are collections of works of Nevim. That's most of them. But again, the question is, that maybe not why each one was written, But the Nevot of Yirmiyahu, which are recorded in the book, and how they're presented, that's what's called later redaction and later canonization, there must be a reason. What I want to suggest is, it could be the book was put together the way it's given to us, and what's recorded, to answer the question, which we're going to talk about in a couple of days, called Echa, or Echa, which means, what's Echa mean? Yeah, so either what or how, basically, how did this happen to us? One way to understand Eicha is how could God do this to us? How could God be so mean? We've heard that question before. How could such a tragedy happen? How did this happen? Of course, if you're catching on to Navi, what does the Navi do? We take the question of how did God do this to us to rather 
what did, you, what did we do wrong to deserve this? The question the Navi is going to ask is, what's going wrong? And I want to use that to explain, again, what's happening in the book of Yermiel and try to explain how the book is not just informative to tell us what happened, but rather transformative, not just to know why the temple was destroyed, but what we can do to make sure it won't happen again. Let me share with you what I think you remember from Yermiel besides a couple songs. Right? What is Yermiel famous for? Give me just one example. I'm, I'm sure you're going to say. Right? But he made a prediction of the destruction of the temple. And what makes a Navi great? If your predictions come true, you're a great Navi. Of course, I'm only kidding. <laughs> Yermiel's goal was not to predict the temple from being destroyed. In fact, his life basically was a failure. I'll explain why I mean that in a minute. His goal was not to predict the temple would be destroyed. And, and what makes the Navi great is not the fact that his predictions come true. The goal of Yermiel was to prevent the temple from being destroyed. And it didn't work. I'll give you a terrible example, but they both are in business for 40 years. If you read the opening lines of Yermiel, his, his career is 18 years during the reign of Yoshiel, you have it on the page, 11 years under Yehoiakim and 11 years under Tzitkiel, by chance, 40 years. Who else had a career of 40 years? Moshe Rabbeinu. Again, another failure. Now, that doesn't mean Moshe was great. His life was a failure for his generation. His book was a great success. Correct? The same thing with Yermiel. His own life, his own goal of saving his generation and saving Jerusalem and the temple, he failed. But his greatest success is we're still here today because of his book, which he deserves you know, credit for that, almost like Moshe Rabbeinu. With his own generation, unfortunately, it was a terrible failure. There's a book about that called Sefer Bamidbar. But his book, it's been a great seller. It's like the book. Now, what you probably remember again is that Yermiel predicted the temple being destroyed. And he also predicted what else? That after 70 years, it'll be rebuilt. Again, another misunderstanding, which I'll try to explain why. Yermiel never predicted that the temple will be destroyed to the point that it's irreversible, meaning he warned it might be destroyed. His goal was not to say it's going to happen. His goal was to get the people to repent so it wouldn't happen. But he would have been the happiest person if it didn't come true. It did come true. He also doesn't say that after 70 years you're going to come back from exile or after 70 years it's going to be rebuilt. He never says that. He says after 70 years there'll be a possibility of its return. There's a big difference between the two. The Navi is not saying what will happen, he's saying what can happen. That's a totally different way of understanding Nebuah. Knowing something will happen, you sit back and relax. This is the final redemption, we sit back and let it happen. Knowing something can happen, that means the responsibility is no longer God's, but it's yours. But the very fact that it can happen, as opposed to it can't happen, that's, that's an important message, because people might think they're like dry bones in exile. And there's no possibility of return once you're in exile, Knowing that there can be redemption is what's important. Now, Yermia was very similar to other Nevim in the fact that they warned the people for what kind of things? For idol worship, for bad behavior, for social injustice, for keeping Shabbat. That's almost all the Nevim share. What also is common to all the Nevim that no one listens to them? In case you ever read, the only Navi people listened to was Yonah. And it wasn't us, it was a non-Jewish city that listened to them. Um, but people don't listen to the Nevim, but at least they can say afterwards, I told you so. So in one way, Yermio is very similar, but there's something very different about Yermio's life, and that's the goal of the Shir now, is Yermio is the first Navi, at least the way I see it, that gets involved in politics, which is a very hot topic if you're living in Israel, unfortunately, or fortunately, whatever. You, it's, we're fortunate to have our own country that we can fight about how, how, how to lead our country. Um, now, what do I mean by getting involved in politics? The goal of this year is to understand that one of Yermiel's key prophecies, which is going to change his life in the whole country, is political and not religious. And that's why they hate him, that's why they want to kill him, that's why there's so many colleagues of his who are arguing with him. But he's going to make a prophecy later on, not just a prophecy, he's going to give guidance, and he's going to tell the people in the middle of his career, in the fourth year of Yehoiakim, that in the name of God, the Jewish people are supposed to do what? 
put up a white flag and surrender to the Babylonians. And that's the word of God. No other Navi said something so similar. What all the Navim, what all the Navim come and say is, repent, right, and I'll save you. Continue idol worship or bad ways, and I'll punish you. But there's always a possibility of what's called tshuva. Yemri himself will say that. You know the song you sing, Hinei Kachomer Biyad HaYotzer? And Slichot, I think, isn't it? Or, um, no, it's, it's um, Yom Kippur night, isn't it? Yeah, Yom Kippur night, um, Kol Nidre. That's from Yemri chapter 18. What's the theme of that song? Just like um, clay in the hand of the potter, and will, he can mess up, he can reshape it, and he can fix it. The meaning, and the whole message behind it is, no matter how bad you are, you can always fix your ways. That has to do with part of his prophecies. But there's another message he's going to give later on, that something is said that's not going to change. He doesn't say that for sure the temple is going to be destroyed by the Babylonians. He doesn't say you're going to go into exile. He says, no matter what you do, you have to give in to the Babylonians. If you do give in, what will happen? You can stay in your land, and you can keep your temple. But what he says, which is out of the box for Navim, he's giving a political instruction to the people, and especially to the leader and to the king, to make a political decision to accept Babylonian sovereignty and not to rebel. Got that? Imagine if we had a rabbi like that saying things like that today. He, he wouldn't pass a chuzah hasima, that's for sure. <laughs> Maybe he wouldn't even get 4,000 people to sign <laughs> to get free advertising. Um, we have to see, though, that that's not the first prophecy he gives. It's a prophecy in the middle of his career. It's a turning point in his career. What we're going to do now in the shir is try to explain the historical background to the book and to this prophecy, which is going to change the whole book and change Jewish history. What do I mean by historical background? I'll try to keep it simple because, again, it's late in the day. I'm going to use an analogy from nowadays only for the sake of analogy, not for the sake of political opinions. The time period of Yirmiyahu is the earliest example of what we would call Rishit Smichat Gulatenu. Understand that concept? The beginning of our redemption? Yirmiyahu was living in a time period where the worst is over, the Shoah, put it that way. You know what a Shoah is? The, the, like, a, a very early type of Holocaust was over. And now there's a whole new start. The people see their time period as the beginning of the Second Temple period. I'll explain what I mean. If someone asked you, why was the first temple destroyed? What's the classic answer they tell you? Remember the big three? Idol worship, um, Gil Arayot, whatever that's called in English. Um, Arayot. Um, immorality and Shvichud Damim. All the psukim the rabbis bring are from the time, from the Navi Yeshayahu, from the time of Chizkeo and Menashe. The first temple period, for all intents and purposes, is over after the Assyrians conquer Israel. Remember Ashur, Assyria, Sancheriv, and the kings before him from Tikal Pileser? For over 100 years, the Assyrians wipe out Israel. They wipe out the northern tribes, they're all exiled. They destroy most of Yehuda, Lachish, if you've been to any museum. The real one in the British Museum, we've got the original and the copy here. The Lachish wall. The, the fall of Lachish by Sancheriv, that was a massive victory. That's like destroying Tel Aviv. That was a big city. All the great cities of Yehuda are destroyed. Yushim is saved at the last minute. Under Chizkiel, his son Menashe is worse. He does idol worship. Menashe goes into exile. For all intents and purposes, by 700 or so BCE, even a little bit later, late 680s, during the reign of King Menashe, it's over. And the questions will be the recovery. Menashe's son, Amon, takes over for two years. He's assassinated. Uh, not the first time or last time, unfortunately, in Jewish history. Um, he's assassinated, and his son, Yoshio, you've heard of him, King Josiah, or Yoshio, takes over when he's eight years old, which means he's not running the country. It means that old people are running the country. But he goes to school. When Yoshio is eight years into his reign, or he's age 16, he goes to Yeshiva Tichonit, which means he goes to, he goes to Yeshiva. He goes... He becomes religious. He starts learning. That's what the source is in Tiberi Amim. And then, four years later, in about the, when he's about, um, I guess, 20, he, it's the 13th year of his reign. He begins his career. And what does he do? It's called the Reform of Yoshiel, or the Josean Reform. You might have heard of it. Yoshiel, unlike any king before him, 
gets rid of all the idol worship from the country. It's on your short seat for homework, the source. Again, it's late in the afternoon. We're not going to read all these psukim from Divrei Amim because your phone's probably running out of batteries by now. <laughs> and you didn't bring Tanakhi, most of you. I hope I'm not so mean. <laughs> now, but take my word for it. In the 13th year of his, of his reign, 12th, 13th year of his reign, he begins purging the country from all idol worship. It's gone. He begins renovating the temple. But there's a tremendous return of tshuva. And guess what? That's the very first year of the reign of Yirmiyo, isn't it? Yirmiyo begins his career in year 13 of Yoshio. That coincides with the reform of Yoshio. Understand that? The prophet who's behind this Reshitz Michat Goloteinu, who's behind this national revival and religious revival is Yirmiyo. What enables the revival? A very good reason. Ashur falls apart. They would say nowadays the Iron Curtain falls. Right? Our old enemy is gone. If I was 18 year old, it would be King King, I mean, Ding Dong, the witch is gone. If you remember that one. Ashur, who was our arch enemy for over 100 years, is finally gone. No new superpower has taken over yet. There's a vacuum in the Middle East. And who fills that vacuum? Yoshio, King Yoshio, is able to grow like crazy. We have the archaeology that supports it and the sources in Chumash. Our borders are back up north. We back to the Galil. We have the Shomron. The country is going leaps and bounds, and everyone thinks this is Rashid Smichat Goloteno. The worst is over, and we have a whole new beginning. Idol worship is gone. In the midst of all this, they find the first Dead Sea Scrolls. Understand the analogy? Maybe? <laughs> In year 18, six years into this reform, they're renovating the temple. What do they find? They find the original. Remember the where is the Torah, the official version of the Torah kept? Right? In the Aron, but Menashe destroyed the temple. The, Ashur didn't, we did it ourselves. Ashur, Menashe wiped out everything. Closed down the temple, made a temple for Ashur instead. The Kohanim put the Aron into Geniza. They put it for safekeeping. And in the renovations, decades later, what did they find? The original Sefer Torah. Don't buy what they tell you in school that they made up Sefer Devarim at the time. That's ridiculous, that theory. And don't say that no one knew the Torah. I can prove it to you. Right? Everyone, the Torah was in everyone's bookshelf. No one ever read it. And I can bring you a lot of examples. The fact that when they read it out loud, no one ever heard of these things shouldn't surprise us. With printing presses, we have that problem today. When they find the book, it's Judaica. They find the original Sefer Torah. And they make a big deal about it. What do they do? Oh, what's the meaning of all this? And it's opened up to the Tochacha. And what happens? Remember, they go to Chuda, the prophetess. And they get the people together, what's going to be, and they warn them how terrible things are going to be. And they say maybe the decree from the time of Menashe is still around. Yoshio takes advantage of that Judaica that they found and gets the people to do a massive tshuva, a massive repentance. They have a massive Passover that year, in year 18 of Yoshio, when they find the Sefer Torah, to undo the decree of destruction and make sure that this is the final redemption. They're sure it's going to work. And that's Yirmiyo's job is to make sure it happens. Yirmiyo is going to support this all along. And therefore, during the reign of Yoshio, things are going great. People return to religion. Idol worship is gone for a very simple reason. We have nationalism at its highest. Why? Because our enemy is gone. We're growing. And together with that nationalism come religious rebirth. Everyone's it's our religion. We don't have to serve other gods anymore. We have our own god. Our god gives us military strength, economic strength. We're doing great. The tr most tragic event that happens that changes everything is in the 31st year of his reign, about 12, 13 years later, there's events in the Middle East. There's always wars going on, in case you didn't notice. And we're fighting. Again, there's a vacuum in the Middle East. Who's going to take control? Who are always the candidates? There's always Egypt and Mesopotamia. Egypt wants to take control now. Ashur fell apart, but who's the new fledgling empire in Iraq? Or in, uh, Iraq? It's Babel. And there's a war between Babel and Mitzrayim that's going to take place in Karkamish, up, up in Syria. Um, Paro Nechol from Egypt is marching his troops to the land of Israel, has no intention of fighting us. Let's march through. Yoshiel, because this is, what did the rabbi say? He read Chumash. It says, what's Chumash say in the time of redemption? What happens? There won't be any wars. And because this is the final redemption, we can take any risk we want. And we can go to war against the Egyptians. They just can't go in our land. And he's sure God will help them. And guess what? 
God doesn't help us. In fact, he doesn't want us to go to war. Yoshua, unfortunately, is killed in battle, and everyone is depressed. The great king who did all this great reform, who was so religious, is killed in battle. That's depressing for everyone. His son, Yoyakim, who takes over several months later, is so angry with God, he's had it. The people have had it for a very good reason. What was their motivation for following God? God's on our team. Why serve God? If you serve God, we win wars. Of course we're going to daven. If you pray to God and you have a good economy, of course. What happens when things go bad? Well, who needs them? Let's go to other gods. And the people, in light of this, when all of a sudden they start losing battles, and now Babel is this new coming power, maybe Egypt, we're not sure who to align ourselves with or what to do, or not to align with anybody, the people are torn between different choices. Do we follow other gods? Or do we follow our God? But if we follow our God, what do we need to do to win our battles and to continue to grow? We have to daven harder. We have to bring more sacrifices. We have to come to the temple. And here comes the big argument between Yirmiyahu and his colleagues. And that takes us to our first source, Yirmiyahu chapter 7. Um, the, first, again, page, the first page I gave you, the outline, the history, and the religious issue, political issue, and the outline of the book, those are for homework. When you get to 929 and start learning it. So to do those inside, you can't do that late in the afternoon. We're going to get to the fun part, or the fun, say fun, unfortunately, it's not so fun. I want to get to the religious issue, which will lead to the political issue. Yirmiyahu is probably the most famous, the most important prophecy of Yirmiyahu is chapter 7, where he says his main point, again, many have been before and have said it, but he takes it to an extreme. We'll read the first couple lines. It's source A on page 2, where it says key sources. It's the second page when you flip them over. It says as follows. If you want to read from your Tanakh, it's in Perak Zayin, from the first verse, from Pasuk Aleph. Hadabar sher haya el Yirmiyahu meit Hashem limor. The word of God, Hashem Tirmiyo, Amod Bashar Beit Hashem, Bakrat Hashem at the stand at the gate of, the, of God's house, meaning this is a prophecy given to people coming to Shul. These are not idol worshippers. These are religious people coming to Shul to Daven. What's he telling them? Um, Come and bow down to God. The people coming to the Beit HaMikdash to pray to God, to bow down to God. He's giving them a religious message. What is it? You can guess. You want God to return? You want God to dwell with you? You want to continue to live in this land? What's necessary? Not sacrifice and not prayer, but rather improve your behavior. He'll give examples of what he's talking about very soon. And then he's going to argue with his colleagues. Here he has many colleagues, also prophets. God's prophets are not prophets of idol worshippers. But he calls him Nevi'e Sheker. A false prophet in Yirmiyahu's time period is not a prophet of other gods. He's, they're his colleagues. But they're giving a different religious message. What's their message? He's making fun of them. Don't put your trust in the words of my colleagues who are telling you what? The main thing you need to do is come to God's house and pray and pray and pray. It's not about Hechal Hashem. Hechal Hashem it's, a, it's not the reason for God's help. It's a reflection of God. It doesn't create the relationship. It's a reflection of a relationship. If we have a Beit HaMikdash, that doesn't mean God... It's not by building a Beit HaMikdash that God Shekhinah is with us. It's God having a Beit HaMikdash in our midst is a sign that he's happy with our behavior. Now, the second we say this, I'm going to take it away right away. But he's going to warn us over and over again. If we don't get the message, then we have to warn to take it away. Okay. So he tells him, don't put your trust in what my colleagues are saying. That's all about the temple. Instead, classic, improve your ways. What do you need to do? And is how you're acting. Malachem is what you're thinking about. And alila is what you're plotting to do. There's, there's what you do and what you think about doing. It's what you do when you leave shul, what you think about when you talk about during, what you're plotting to do beforehand. So improve how you act and what you think about what you're planning to do. Imasut tasu mishpat be'ishu be'nereu, all the classic um, social justice ideas, being kind to one another. Uh, remember, there's always good reasons for sinat chinam. You know that line? I hope you understood it. <laughs> if you want examples, just read the papers. Um, or the Shabbos things. The, um, okay. um, what else did it say? The stranger alert from the widow, don't take advantage of them, don't oppress them, don't spill innocent blood, don't text and drive, don't think I can get away with it. 
Don't, don't act in a way that causes to follow the rules. Innocent blood is people who die whose death could have been prevented had people been more careful. Could be building accidents and things like that. But then the key is anytime you have a society where life is taken lightly. You know, construction workers can fall off and what, who cares? It's, you know, it's no one we know. Or might, maybe it might be someone even not Jewish, so I'm, I'm, I'm being um, sarcastic, okay? When life is taken lightly, God is angry. You read that in Parshat Masay last week, didn't we? Why do we need a Remy Klot? Because if there's dam naki, if there's innocent blood being spilled, God can't dwell in that land. Remember? The land that If you want God to be with us, you can't have bloodshed. You can't have innocent bloodshed. The, um, then he says what? If you act that way and don't follow other gods, then then you can stay and dwell in this land. Then he gives the, then he yells at them. Look what he's quoting. Pasuk Tet, verse 9. Are you going to still, get, you see this is the last half of the Ten Commandments? Are you going to steal? Are you going to murder? Are you going to do adultery? Swear falsely? We'll talk about offering uh, incense to uh, the Baal God and following other gods. And then, then you come to God's house, the house that's associated with God's reputation, and you come to David and think you can get away with that? You're coming to, to cover your problems? What Yirmiyah was saying, there's no point in coming to the Beit HaMikdash if your behavior at home is unjust. And it's almost counterproductive because this name is associated with God's reputation. If the people claiming to be God's people, the people praying to God, waving the flag were God's people, claiming to be a special nation, talking about God, saying Hodu Lashem, praying publicly about God, and the same people talk about God and pray to God all day long, their society is corrupt, and they act in a way which is unjust and obnoxious and unfair and cheating, and that's what they're known for. God says that's worse than if they didn't come to the temple at all. In other words, if you weren't religious and you were unjust, okay, so you're bad, but it's worse when you're religious and unjust because you make me look bad. And that's why the biggest punishments come when we're the most religious. It's the, of the, the rise of Ashur, what Ashur did to us in time of Chizkiel. We'll read this Haftar this week in Ishayo. Our biggest punishment during the reign of Chizkiel where we're bringing tons of korbanot and it's not helping because our society is still unjust. You're going to read Haftar this week. The same thing with Yirmiyahu's time period. It's because we're so religious, because we're coming to the temple that God's angry. Why does Yirmiyahu call these people worshiping Baal? Yoshio got rid of the Baal. Baal worship is long gone. Baal worship is a rain god in general. A rain god means I pray to God because I want rain. I'm not praying to God to remember that I'm chosen by God to be his model nation. I'm not praying to God to remember how I have to behave. Rather, I'm praying to God so it'll give me rain. If God, won't be, if God doesn't give me rain or health or wealth, whatever it is, why pray to him? If prayer is only about what's in it for me, if you believe God's powerful, but your connection to God is based on what he can give to me, Yirmiyahu calls that Avodat Baal. Because in essence, that's what it is. You turn your God into a rain God. If you pray to God to remember how I have to behave, what it means to be God's people, then what does God promise? We say in Shema, follow my laws, build that just society. Sanctify me in your day-to-day -day life as people, as a community, as a nation, and I'll give you rain at the right time, and I'll have peace in the land. But when there's, when there's a war going on, when there's a national calamity about to happen, when there's a, a crisis of a, of a drought or a, um, a lack of rain or an epidemic, what's the Navi always say? God's bringing that to you as a, as a wake-up call, so you'll do tshuva. It's not that those things happen by chance. That's how God talks to you. Now, when that happens, what are we supposed to do? We gather together in the Mikdash to hear the rabbi's speech. We gather to the Mikdash to ask ourselves not to pray to God, take away the epidemic. Not to pray to God, give us back our reign. We pray to God to ask ourselves, what are we doing wrong? So we have Bismarck Tilim, we say in the Mikdash. Remember the Shir Shoyom, it's about how we have to behave, the rabbi's speeches, about how to improve our behavior with the understanding that God interaction with us is based on our behavior, that's transformative tefillah. That's tefillah that understands what does God promise. If you understand why you're being punished and you take upon yourself to do better, remember, then God gets rid of the punishment. You say that, 
Madrina Turab Zerah, we say that in davening all the time. It's not just prayer, it's prayer together with repentance, understanding what you did wrong, and acting better, doing just things. Then God takes away the punishment. You don't pray to God to get rid of the punishment. You pray to remember to be deserving of God's help. If you pray just, oh God, you're magical, you can do these things. This magic, say these magic words, or go say these magic you know, incantations, and then God will help you. Yirmiyahu calls that avodat bal. Now, there's never, that's, this is an ancient thing. Things like that never happen nowadays. But um, in ancient times, that was a problem. Or maybe not. Now, um, that's his key message. Now comes his big point. What does he say? Verse 13. I've been sending you prophets to warn you, you don't listen. I called out to you, you didn't answer. The same fate that Shiloh had, the Mishkan and Shiloh was destroyed in the beginning of Sefer Shmuel, the same fate will happen to the Mikdash. What do the other colleagues say? Oh, that was the Mishkan that was temporary. God's house can't be destroyed. Every destruction begins with the exact same false prophecy. Convincing the people God's house can never be destroyed. If you read the story of the Second Temple period, I think people say th similar things today. The understanding that no matter how bad we are, God's house will never be destroyed, that leads to, it, it can lead to a terrible misunderstanding of taking things easy. You pray and hope that it won't be destroyed, but you always know that if our behavior is bad, we'll have to take it away. What are his colleagues saying? Oh, no, that's different. They're saying, Hechal Hashem, Hechal Hashem. You have to have emunah that God's house will protect you. So maybe it might be destroyed if you don't dive in hard enough. But if you dive in hard enough and believe that God will help you, then it will be fine. And you know, is giving a totally different take about what the people need to do. And that's the argument between Yirmiyahu and the Nevim. Of course, guess who they, who would people rather listen to? They'll listen to, because people listen to prophets, or prophets like to say things that people want to hear. That's how you become famous. Um, and therefore, you say things that people want to hear, of course they're going to follow you. And what the people want to hear is if we pray and dive in hard enough, God will come and save us. And Yemen was telling them it's way more than that. And they don't listen. Four years later, in the fourth year of Yehoiakim, I'm sorry, this, around the same time period, we reach a turning point. Yemen doesn't say the temple will be destroyed. He says, if you don't do tshuva, it will be destroyed. That takes us to the um, to source C. We're going to skip B in the meantime. In source B, in source C, this is the um, watershed event, whatever it's called. This is a turning event in his career where it becomes political. It's chapter 25, and it's not by chance we have a double date. What's the double date? This is the word of Yirmiyahu. In what year? To all the people. The fourth year of Yehoiakim. Again, this is about 20 years into his, uh, 22 years into his career. Again, four years after Yehoiakim, after Yoshiao died in the battle of Megiddo. But he has shanari shonit Nebuchadnezzar melech Bavel. It's the first year of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Bavel. What's that mean? How can we have a double date? Because the rise of Babel to power is the beginning of the end. And what's Yemiel going to say now? I've been warning you for the last some 20 years to do proper tshuva. Your tshuva has been skin deep. He's going to say that over and over again. It's phony, your tshuva. You're doing tshuva because you're, because of your nationalism. You're happy that God's helping you. But the second God doesn't help you, you leave him. He says, you're not doing what God wants. I gave you a head start. You didn't take advantage of it. Now he's saying, what's your punishment? We'll skip now to the, um, I'm sorry, Pasuk Tet. He says as follows. I'm going to send the families from the north. My servant, Nebuchadnezzar. Now, Nebuchadnezzar didn't put Davin three times a day. Maybe not to our God. He's not from, but he's called an Eved Hashem. Why? Because God uses Nebuchadnezzar as his tool to punish us. What does he say? I'm going to bring them on the land and all the nations around and I'm going to wipe them out to destroy them. And How can we sing that at a wedding? We don't sing this Pasek, of course not. He says, it's going to be so bad there'll be no more celebrations, no more weddings. In the prophecies of redemption of Nechama, of comfort later on, he's going to say, Shama. A time will come when we'll start singing again. But during that time period, of the time of the Korban, it's gone. Nothing to celebrate. Flip the page over. 
Pasuk Yer Aleph, the famous line, Vaitakola Arts Azot Le Chorva, again, verse 11, this land will now be in destruction. Vabdu Hagoyme Elet Melech Bavel Shibim Shana. Vaikim Lot Shibim Shana, I've called it Melech Bavel. I've called Melech Bavel. Yemiah is not predicting that for the next seven years the temple is destroyed. He's not predicting you're going to be seven years in exile. He's making a totally different prediction. Prediction. He's making a statement. For the next 70 years, the Babylonians are running the Middle East. Nothing you can do about it. God, just, God gave you a chance. He warned you for years, for decades. You didn't get the message. For the next 70 years, it's a lost cause. But Bell's in charge. I put him in charge. You have to accept that. It's a bitter pill to accept. But if you accept that, what will happen? You can keep your city. You can keep your country. You'll be under autonomy. But sovereign will be Bavel. And no one wants to hear that. About that? That's why right afterwards, as soon as he says this, they want to kill him. They put him on trial. Now, they can't put him on trial for making a political statement. They put him on trial for making a false prophecy that he predicted the temple might be destroyed. That's the excuse. The reason is his political prophecy. The excuse is, you said something, you know, against the Munah. Now, you might think that it's you might think that no matter what, Babel's going to come and destroy the land. He makes it very clear in chapter 27. Yemiel goes around with, with yokes on his shoulder. He wears a yoke, which says, meaning accept the yoke of Babel. There's a meeting in chapter 27 going on with all the foreign ministers of the Middle East. Take a look. Um, God tells Yemiel to make a yoke and make a lot of little yokes to give to, your, uh, to these visiting emissaries. Look who's coming in the Middle East. Nothing's changed. All the neighboring countries in Lebanon, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, all the different countries are coming and meeting with Tzidkiel. For what reason? They're planning a revolt against the Babylonians. Who's going to support them? Egypt. They're going to break what God said. God said, except Babel, they're going to break that, that commandment, that instruction, and they're going to rebel against Babel with the hope of having a coalition with the backing of Egypt. What's Yemiel tell all these people meeting? He sends with them yokes and say, accept the yoke of Bavel. And then he gives the conditions. In fact, this is a Rashi you might remember from the beginning of Chumash. Look in verse, in verse 5, Pasuk He says, says, Anochi asiti et aretz adam ba'abema asher p'nek b'chokhi agadol v'zoriyam tuya untatil asher yashar b'inai. What does Yemiel tell all these emissaries, including the king of Yehuda? God created everything with his great strength. And he gives it to who? To whoever who he sees fit. Remember that Pasuk quoted by Rashi, the first Rashi in Chumash, which you probably misunderstood? Remember Rashi asked a question, or Rabbi Yitzhak asked a question, Rashi quotes him. Shouldn't Chumash begin as a law book? Why do we need Sefer Breshit? So people usually teach it because we need to know the land of Israel belongs to us, in case they say we stole it. Rashi didn't say that. I need Sefer Breshit to know that the land belongs to God. It's over Chumash, isn't it? It's called the land of Canaan because it was theirs. God took it away from the Canaanites because of their bad behavior. Is giving it to us for us to behave properly. And therefore, we need to know that the land of Israel is our responsibility. It's not our, it doesn't belong to us. It belongs to God. We have it on rent on the condition we act properly. And it warn us over and over again, if we do a lousy job, they'll throw us out. We'll always be his people, and one day we'll always come back. But it's a responsibility to the land, and the verse that Rashi quotes is when he takes it away from us and gives it to Bavel. And he quotes right from here. What does he say in Pasuk Vav? He goes on and says, anyone who doesn't put themselves on the yoke of Bavel, he'll be wiped out by Bavel. Bavel is going to destroy any country that doesn't accept their sovereignty. Verse 11, Pasuk Yeralef, V'agoy asher yavi et savro ba'o melech Bavel. Any nation that accepts Babylonian sovereignty, Bavado, and serves them, Vinachtiv ad mato num Hashem, Bavada, Vyashabba. Any nation who accepts Babylonia, you can stay in your land, you have to go anywhere. If you fight them, you're finished. Do you understand what Yemiel was doing? A Navi involved in politics. All the foreign emissaries from all the Middle East are coming and planning a revolt. He's saying, don't rebel in the name of God. And he predicts and says, anyone who rebels is to be wiped out by Babel. Anyone who gives in will, be, will stay alive. Verse 12, I said the same thing to Tzidkiel. Put your neck under the yoke of Bavel and serve him and you'll live. Why should you die? And listen carefully to verse 14, Pasuk Yadalad. Don't listen to these false prophets. 
אומרים עליכם לא תאבדו את מלך בבל. Don't listen to the rabbis who are saying fight Babel. You can win. Don't, don't accept their sovereignty. Instead what? Ki sheker im nibim lachem, ki lo shelachtim nu Hashem beim nibim bishmi lashaker. What are the false prophets doing? In God's name, they're countering Yirmiyahu. Yirmiyahu is saying in God's name, we have to rebel against Babel. No one, no one wants to hear that. But Yirmiyahu is a famous prophet. What do they say? We also have nevuah. God told us exactly the opposite. You ever hear a situation where two rabbis saying opposite messages, and in in both in the name of God? And they're both sure they're 100% right. Now, Yirmiyahu's colleagues are sure he's wrong. Got that? But they care about the people. Now, here's where it gets messy and ugly. Why? Yirmiyahu now becomes public enemy number one. Because if the political government and the people have accepted we're going to fight Bavel, I need every soldier fighting. It's going to be difficult to fight Bavel. I need a coalition. No one can break lines. And if I have a rabbi going around and telling people, don't fight Bavel, as Yirmiyahu is going to say, and if you fight Bavel, you're going to lose. If you want to stay alive, go to the enemy. He's going to ruin morale. There's no way we can take on the Babylonians. He becomes a security risk. And they put him in jail. And they want to kill him. And he has to go into hiding. Again, that's, when you read the book, you half the chapter, not half, about a good 20% of the chapter is about Yirmiyahu in hiding. Yirmiyahu writing his books um, clandestinely. Yirmiyahu's books being burnt by the king. Yirmiyahu what, again, fighting with all the false prophets. The false prophets wanting to kill him. And he, hate, he doesn't like his prophecy, but he has to say it. Then you have the famous showdown in chapter 28, in the time of Tzidkiel, where Yirmiyahu is walking around with his yoke, telling the people to give it to Babel, not to rebel. It's the fourth year of Tzidkiel. Again, I'm purposely staying away from the technical history, not to make it complicated. But we have this during Yehoiakim and Tzidkiel, the same thing of giving in to Babel. Because what happened was, during the raid of Yehoiakim, Yirmiyahu said, give in. They don't listen, they rebel. Melech Babel comes in, Nebuchadnezzar himself comes. They take over the city. Why don't they destroy the temple? You know why? Why, de why doesn't Nebuchadnezzar destroy the temple the first time he comes in? In the 11th reign of, of like, under Yehoiachin. You know why? Because ultimately Yehoiachin listens to Yirmiyahu, puts up a white flag, and leaves like a mensch. Doesn't he? Yehoiachin puts up a white flag, the whole royal family, all the big shots, they leave, it's called Galut Yehoiachin, they leave in an orderly fashion. They give up, they put up a white flag, they accept Babylonian sovereignty. Who's the puppet king put in charge? Tzitkiel. In fact, his name was, um, they changed his name to Tzitkiel. His name was Matanya. Matanya. <laughs> There's another version of that name. Um, they changed his name to Tzitkiel because that's what he needs to do, to do Tzedek Mishpat, we'll see. He doesn't listen. And after four years, what does Tzitkiel decide to do? To rebel. We can take on the Babylonians. They don't listen to Yemriel. They listen for a couple years. But what saved Yerushalayim the first time was Yoyachin putting up a white flag. After four years, Tzitkiel decides to rebel, and they're having a big argument. And guess what happens? This guy named Hanania ben Azor, who's a Navi from Givon, again, from Navi, he's talking in God's name in God's house. He goes up to Yirmiyahu and he breaks his yoke. And what's he say? Just like I broke your yoke, just like I broke the yoke on your soldier, what's going to happen? God's going to break the yoke of Melech Pavel. Take a look in chapter, on source E. In source, um, in Pasuk Yud, in Perach Avchet, He takes the yoke off Yirmiyahu and he breaks it. And what's he say? He says what? I'm saying, he says, he says, in the name of God, in the eyes of all the people. Yirmiyahu, you said it's going to happen seven years till, Yirmi, till Babel falls? It's going to happen in two years. We got what's called a pazam. We made it shorter. And everyone applauds. Hanani ben Azur, Yirmiyahu leaves, can't say anything. We rebel against Babel, and it works for a couple years. By the ninth year, Nebuchadnezzar comes back with his army. Lays the siege, remember, on Asar B'Tevet? A year and a half later, in the 11th year, in Tammuz, there's a, they break the wall. And on the 7th of Av, the temple is destroyed. Remember, Tisha B'Av and Bait Rishon was on the 7th, in case you didn't know that. Just, never mind. Um, but the temple is ultimately destroyed. Why? Because Yirmiyahu was right. God wanted them to give in to Babel. What could have saved Yerushalayim had you simply put up a white flag and accepted? Now, all the false prophets see Yirmiyahu as a danger because he's a political danger. 
and therefore they want to kill him. He has to go into hiding. He, he has a terrible life. He, he wishes he died. We'll see later on. He curses the day he was born. He hates his job. He's forced to stay because he's a Navi. But he complains to God, what do you want from me? No one's listening to him. Now there's something interesting. And we'll conclude with this. Who remembers? We're going to re you read it a week and a half ago. What was the first prophecy the Emil got? What was it? What did God show him? Remember? It was Tubashvat. That wasn't, but he saw a Makel Shakade. He saw a Shakade, an almond tree blossoming. And what was that a sign of? A, that, hey, you, you're old enough to become a prophet. You're, you have smicha, basically. Because Yimriel thought, I'm, just an, I'm, not, I'm still in training. I'm an apprentice. And God says, no, you're ready. So it could be because it's going to happen fast. That's what God says. But if you know your Chumash, where is there a story about a makel shaked? Where is there an almond branch that flowers? Aaron. Why do we need that for? If you read Chumash, not to prove that Aaron was chosen. That we know. If you read Chumash... The purpose of that little miracle was to show the people and tell them to stop complaining about God. Because God brought all these miracles with the, the ground swallowing up Korach and all those in Dathan Baviram and the fire. And they said, Moshe, you killed them. Remember? The people are consistently complaining about God and about Moshe. Saying, God, it's not fair what you're doing to us. How come you're killing us? How come you brought us out of Egypt? The people are complaining about God and blaming all their trouble on God. And what's the job of the Navi? To tell the people when something goes wrong, don't blame God, blame yourselves. That's the job of a prophet. And that's, if you read the psukim there carefully, what does God tell Moshe to do? Take the matev aron and put it where? In the, next to the aron, as an oat lip de mary, as a sign for rebellion and to put an end to their complaints. To, put, to stop complaining about God and don't blame God for what goes wrong, blame yourselves. It's much easier to blame God. And therefore, the, the whole point of Yimriel was to tell the people, don't blame God for Bavel taking over. Don't, Bevel, don't blame God for the trouble you're having. Blame yourselves for not following God properly. Now, um, one little example to make you guys not feel so bad. Um, in, in source F, Yimriel writes a letter to the people who went into exile, the first wave of exile under Yehoyachin. He tells the people, don't make Aliyah. You ever hear that? The Gemara quotes that. About... Um, Yimriel was talking about for the next 70 years, but in Source F, Yimriel tells the people, he sends a letter to the elders, and the people are saying that we're going to come back. They don't want to unpack. They don't want to build houses. They don't want to get married. And Yimriel tells them, for the next 70 years, you're in Bavel, stay there. Build houses, get married, and pray for uh, making Mishabarek for the state there. You can read it later in chapter 29. Now, I mentioned that Yimriel's prophecy is not just telling the events that happened, and not just uh, explaining the events. The reason we have it is save the Jewish people. Because imagine if there wasn't a Navi like Yimriel telling the people about what's going to be. If the only voice they heard was, God will help you as long as you pray. If the only voice they heard was, the temple can't be destroyed. And if you pray hard enough, Babel won't defeat you. And let's say the temple was destroyed and Babel took over. What would there be attitude to God be? Well... God left us, we'll leave him. Or maybe there is no God. If your meal has to be on record, that what? So he can say, I told you so. God tells him that you're going to, no one's going to listen to you. You have a terrible, he was hoping they would listen. Again, he failed. The people didn't take his nevoah. They rebelled against Bavel. And we lost the city, we lost the temple. But he tells them, also, you're not going to come back for sure after 70 years. For the next 70 years, there's nothing to talk about. But after 70 years, Bavel's going to fall. And when Bavel falls, you have a chance of returning if you do tshuva. Alex, I'm sure, talked about that, right? Two models of returning. First, we do tshuva. Or first, does God bring us back? That's Yermiel Yechaskel. What Yermiel is telling the people, after 70 years, you have a chance to return if you're ready. It makes sense. You're in rehab. You're not dry bones. It's not over. That's Yechaskel. But if you do tshuva and you're ready to return, I want you to come back. But you need a little time out. Um, I want to conclude and relate this a little bit to Tisha B'Av, in case you didn't catch the analogy still now. Um, we're going to read the Haftarah from Yimriyo, aren't we? Tisha B'Av morning, chapter 8 and 9. But there's a famous question that the rabbis ask, what caused the Chorban? If you have your Tanakh open, or a uh, Gemara with you, it's in, um, it's Bab, I think, Baba Metziah Pehei, 85. But the Gemara quotes the Pasuk in Yimriyo, chapter 9, 
Perktet Pasuk Yud Aleph, verse 11. I'll just read it slowly. My five minutes, ten minutes, perfect. Mia Isha Chacham Viavein Zot, Asher Diber Hashem Elav Viagida, Viagida, I'm sorry. Vama of the Haaretz Nistak Midbar Bibliover. You may ask the question, what question? Who is wise and can understand all this that happened? Why did everything go bad? Why was the land scattered and lost? What went wrong? So the Gemara says as follows. The answer did. The Navi gives, They left my Torah. You didn't follow me. He gives this whole exhortation of the people. The Gemara on Baba Metzia Pehe says as follows. Amar of Yehuda Marav. My dichtiv mi ha'isha chacham v'yavenetzot. Who is the wise man who understands this? What's he saying? Ab asher diber Hashem, asher diber pi I love. The passage we just quoted. Amav the Haaretz. Amru chachamim v'lo pirushua. They said it to the wise men. They didn't have an explanation. They said it to the Nevi'im. And they also had no explanation. And God himself had an answer. And we quoted the Pasuk. What did the rabbis say? What did God mean? The rabbis say the most interesting thing, saying, what did they do wrong? Shulo birchuba Torah tchila. Remember learning that? Before they studied Torah, what didn't they do? They didn't make a blessing. That sounds like a misdemeanor, not a felony. If God's going to destroy the temple, I expect a felony. You didn't make a bracha before learning Torah? That's a misdemeanor. They're onto something. What bracha do we make before Torah study? Remember? We want the Torah study to be sweet in our mouths. We and our children should be what? Okay. I'm sorry. Um, your day, what's it say? Um, say it for me. Um, your day Torah I'm sorry. Your day Shmecha. No, your day Torah Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, we should learn the Torah Lishma for its purpose. We'll follow the Baal Shem Tov. Not for the sake of just learning, but for the sake of why it was given to us. Okay? But we, are, we say we need to know God. What does it mean to know God? I'm going to show you in Yirmiyahu. Yirmiyahu's got one of his biggest points of what does it mean to know God. It's going to be the last line of the Aftarah we're going to read on Tisha B'Av. I'm going to share with you for the last five minutes what it means to know God according to the prophets. Remember Shiloh was destroyed? Who was bad? Remember Pinchas and Hophni uh, and Pinchas? What was their sin? Don't give me the whole list. The opening line. B'nai li lo yaduat Hashem. They didn't know God. You read last Shabbos at the Haftarah. There were four groups that, God, that the Nabi was angry with. Who were they? Remember? Anavim nivu babal. Remember? Ba'koni v'tovsei atura lo yaduuni. I'm sorry. Konim nivu babal v'tovsei atura lo yaduuni. Those teaching Torah didn't know God. And the prophets gave prophecies about Baal. And the leaders didn't follow my instructions. What does it mean, according to Yirmiyahu, to know God? So I'm going to simply quote the last line of the Aftarah that we're going to read on Tisha B'Av morning. We're in Perak Tet, so look in Perak Tet, Pasach Abet. If you remember from Shul, we change the tone. We do the Yirmiyahu like Echa, and the last two lines, we sort of wake up a little bit and change the tone. But it's a different change of tone of voice. It's not anything, it's not, God's not promising redemption. He's giving an instruction. What does he say? Um, again, in chapter, chapter 9, verse 22, or Perak Tet Pasach Abet. Have it? Kol Mar Hashem, I'm sure you remember by heart. Aitalau chacham b'chokhmato, v'aitalau gibor b'kvurato, v'aitalau ashir b'ashro. God says, he who is wise shouldn't boast about how smart he is. And who is strong shouldn't boast about how strong he is. And who is rich shouldn't boast about how wealthy he is. The Navi is not saying it's not good to be strong, wealthy, or, um, what was it? Strong, wealthy. Or wise. Those are tools and not goals. It, I can use my wisdom and I can use my strength and my financial strength. I can use them in the service of God, but I don't boast in them. That's not the goal. Those are tools. Instead, what should a person boast about and what should be his goal in life? He needs to study and to know God. What is it being here to know God? I'm the God who does what? Who does kindness, chesed. Chesed, tzedek and mishpat, justice and righteousness in the land, because that's what he wants. It's, if we're going to have a temple, it's our reminder of how we have to act, how we represent God as a nation. The main thing God wants us to be is a just people, the society that we build. Without ritual, without a temple, without mitzvot, of course we're going to forget that. To be God's people for thousands of years, you, you need the ritual. 
But if you, the ritual becomes mechanical and doesn't reflect a deeper understanding of what it means to be God's people, then you're doing acts without understanding them. Therefore, what do you do before you do a mitzvah? You make a bracha. Got the idea? If you're studying Torah and just following it mechanically, Torah means an instruction book. If I follow it mechanically and don't remember why you were chosen, you miss the whole point. And that's what the prophets are yelling about that's going to cause the destruction. Um, one more example from Yimriel. In chapter 22, this makes it to Shmon I want to prove to you that to the last minute, the temple can be saved. All they need to do is give in to Bavel and not rebel. But what's necessary, though, to keep Yerushalayim, as long as they accept Bavel, what the people have to do to keep Yerushalayim? Again, Perak Habet, chapter 22 in Yermiel. Kol mar Hashem, Reit Beit Melech Yudah, Bidibarta Shabbat HaTavar, go to the house of the king of Yudah and say this message, and says, listen, the word of God, the king of Yudah, Hayoshev HaKisei David, you're sitting on the throne of King David. King David was chosen for a reason. David was known for Tzedek Mishpat. We see that in Shmuel. That's all through Tehilim. He says as follows. Komar Hashem, verse 3. Asu Mishpat Rutztaka. Hatzilu Gazum Yarashok. Save that which stolen from he was oppressed. Take care of the Gary Yotom Manamana, the stranger, the orphan, and the widow. Don't cheat one another. Atach Mosu. Don't take advantage and don't use power. Don't have innocent blood in your land. Okay? If that's your society, that's how you live your life, then in this, the gates of this house, the kings can be there forever, the house of David can remain, and you keep your kingdom, and things will be fine. If you don't follow that, if that's not your focus, if that's not the goal of your nation, then God swears to Hashem, that house will be destroyed, and you're going to exile. So that was um, Yirmiyahu's line. What will be in redemption, almost like Yishayo said earlier, in Perech of Gimel, uh, Remember the right before Shema Kaleidu, the last bracha of Gula, is it Semach David? We're hoping for God, the kingdom of David, to sprout up again. We say as follows: Hinei yamim ba'im nu Hashem. Day is coming, God says. Vakimoti le David Semach Tzadik. Umalach Melach Viskil Vasam Ishpad Ustaka Baratz. There'll be something sprouting from the house of David that will sprout up. There'll be a king, and he will do justice and righteousness in the land. During his time period, during his reign, Yehuda will be saved and Yisro will dwell in peace in his land. What would the name's king be? The king's name would be Hashem Tzidkenu, or that should have been Tzidkel. When Tzidkel was appointed to be the king, when Yehoiakim went, went into exile, that should have been Tzidkel. Tzidkel rebelled. He didn't follow this. And he didn't build that kingdom. But... What do we say in Shemun when we pray for redemption, we quote exactly that Pasuk from Yirmiyahu, remembering that, how do we start our redemption? Hashiva Shavtenu Kvarishona. After Tkabah Shofar Garalach Erotenu, we quote from Yishayahu. We're going to read this Shabbos. Hashiva Shavtenu Kvarishona, V'yotzayich Kvat Chila, and Tziyom B'mishpat Tifadeh V'shabeh B'tztaka. The last line of the Torah from Yishayahu, we're going to read on Shabbat Chazon, and then on Tishabah we read from Yirmiyahu. But the Haftarot that the rabbis picked for Tishabah for Shabbat Chazon and for Tishabav, are exactly that idea. We're not learning, oh, we had great prophets because they predicted, their predictions came true. The job of the prophet is, again is to shape history, not to predict history. And we study the book of Yirmiel, not just to find out what happened, not informative, but transformative. We understand why the temple was destroyed, and should some miracle happen, and God bring his people back to their land, let's say 2,000 years later, of waiting and praying, and we come back and have a nation again, have sovereignty again, and we're hoping that it can continue, we can learn from Yirmiyot what God expects to us, not doing calculations and arguing, is this or isn't it? It's not what will be, what can be. So when we dive in and say, this is Rashid Tzmichat Golotenu, it's not a belief that this is a final redemption no matter what. This is for sure an opportunity God's giving us that it can be a final redemption, but it's not up to God, it's up to us. God gives us, we thank Him for the opportunity. If we live up to it, that's our challenge. And uh, either we can take that challenge or blame it on somebody else, but hopefully... Uh, we and our leaders can take that challenge in the nine days, hopefully. Next year will be holidays and not fast days. Thank you.